Our scripture today comes from John. We'll be using the New Revised Standard Version. John 8, excuse me, 17, 18. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And also John 1, 1 to 5, and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. And the word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Alan, we look forward to your message. So we're in the middle of a series, uh, a couple of months here, where we're talking about mission and evangelism and outreach, which is... Uh, a whole set of words that sometimes I don't talk a whole lot about. Or, or sometimes we as a church don't use that language set a whole lot. These words like mission and evangelism and even outreach, uh, the truth of it is I've been using them fairly freely in the last couple of months or so. And I'll admit that I've used these words freely without defining them particularly closely. But before we continue on in this series, we do really need to get on the same page by, about what we mean by them. Or at least, I need to explain what I mean by these words when we use things like mission and evangelism and missionary, or even what it means to go out into the city of Wichita and engage in the mission of God. And the reason that we need to define this is because there are some pretty mixed reactions to this set of language. In fact, I've had plenty of conversations, enough conversations with people in this congregation and beyond to know that some of us have very different responses to these words. Some of us will hear words like mission and evangelism and we get really excited. We may think, man, we don't talk about this enough. We really got to be talking about spreading the good news and preaching the word to people. That's what Jesus really wants us to be doing. We should do more of that. And then there are those of us who hear the words mission and evangelism and it makes our skin crawl. And the reason why we just can't stand these words is because we know about some of the horrific abuses that have been carried out by quote-unquote missionary activities over the centuries. And for the record, as somebody who's studied a fair bit of Christian history, however, you th however bad you think it is, it's worse. And no, it's not other Christians doing all of the things. Brethren have been involved with this as well. To the point where yeah, we should think twice when people start throwing around the words mission or evangelism. Now, what I find really fascinating about these reactions is that I think they're actually responding to the same thing. They're both responding to an understanding and a practice of mission work that has been the default assumption, the gold standard of what mission work is for probably about 1,700 years. The weird thing, however, for me at least, is that, that I find myself in kind of an odd spot because I agree with both of those responses at least to some extent. I do actually think that a core part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ is to spread the good news about Jesus to other people. I also think that the way mission work has been done for the last couple thousand years is actually pretty corrupt and evil. More importantly, however, I think that what most people have in their minds when we talk about mission work or being a missionary is actually something that's not particularly biblical. And it's not really what I think Jesus called us to be doing, and it's certainly not what the early church was doing for the first 300 years of its life. When I use, when I use the word mission and missionary and evangelism, and especially the word missional, 
I mean something very different than the way those words have been used in the past. Now, to understand what I'm talking about and, and what, I, what I mean when I say that we're called to participate in the mission of God, it helps to start with some foundational beliefs, some understandings that undergird all of this. The first of which is the belief that God cares about the whole world. All of it. God cares and loves the entire world. And God wants it to get better than where it currently is. There's also the belief that there are no places where God is not, or that God doesn't care about. What's more, God wants this world here and now to look more like the way God created it to be. A world where everyone and everything is in right or healthy relationship with everyone and everyone else. Everything else, including all of creation and God and even ourselves. That's what God wants for this world. And I also believe that God is already doing that work and has been throughout the course of history, whether or not we're involved with it. That's what God is doing in the world. That's what God's mission is in the world. However, it's also worth saying that one of the foundational beliefs here is, or understandings, is that there is a particular way that God has worked in the world throughout the course of history, which is that God's main plan to accomplish this work of bringing about a better world is to work through human beings to bring about this world, which means that God repeatedly sends people into the world to live out this work of the kingdom. This is one of the more consistent themes that we see through the biblical story, from Abraham and Sarah to Moses to prophets to the disciples and countless more. God is by nature a sending God, sending people into this world to bring about God's mission and to make this world a better place. And we can see that no more clearly than God sending Jesus into the world. All of the Gospels talk about this, but the Gospel of John in particular talks a lot about how God sent Jesus into the world. That's one of the main themes of the book. But there is one particular verse that is key to thinking about how Jesus was sent in the world and also how we are then sent into the world. In John 17, Jesus is praying for his disciples. Interestingly, by the way, it's worth noting that Jesus prays not only for the disciples that he has right then, but he prays for everybody who will become a disciple in the future, which means Jesus is praying for us in this section. So he's praying in this long prayer, and at one point he says to God, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Jesus is sending his disciples in the same way, in the same manner that God sent Jesus into the world. Which means that our sending is a mirror of Jesus' own sending into the world. And so, if we are sent into the world in the same way that Jesus was sent into the world, it's worth asking the question, so how was Jesus sent into the world? And the answer to that comes from the beginning of the Gospel of John. John 1, we have this very familiar part uh, right at the beginning about the Word being God and the Word being with God. Sort of this eternal, grand vision of who Jesus is. But then in verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and lived among us. Different translations say this in different ways, but I love Eugene Peterson's version of this in the message, where he says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Now, there's a lot of ways to talk about this. The big fancy $10 seminary word to talk about this is the incarnation. It's the idea that, that Jesus was on the same, uh, some same plane as God. Jesus is God, this eternal spiritual being that then comes into the world in a very specific time and place through flesh and blood. It's the idea that Jesus was sent into the world to become like humanity, 
to experience the highs and lows of this life as a human being along with us, to celebrate with us, to suffer with us, to be like us. Is the idea of Emmanuel, God with us. Philippians 2 even talks about how Jesus came into the world not with thunder and lightning or as a powerful leader, but Jesus gave up being like God and emptied himself and came into the world as the lowest of the low, as a slave, even becoming so vulnerable that he was killed by the people that he was sent to. That is the manner in which Jesus is sent into the world. And if that is the manner in which Jesus is sent into the world, then that is also the manner in which we are sent into the world. We are sent into this world in an incarnational kind of way to invest our lives in the lives of others, to share our life with them, the highs and the lows, to meet Jesus in them, and also to be the face of Jesus to them, to shape their lives, but to be shaped by ours as well, or to, for ours to be shaped by them as well. To go and be involved in the mission of God is to get involved with what God is already doing doing in this world that's the kind of mission that we are sent on and the reason that we need to be clear about this is that this understanding of what mission work is well that's not actually the way mission work has been done for the vast majority of christian history there has actually been a very different way of doing mission work that may have been done in the name of christ but that ultimately doesn't look a lot like what we see Jesus doing. And it doesn't look like the way that Jesus was sent into the world. And to tell you what I mean about this, I have to tell you a little bit of church history. We know that Jesus lived and died and came back to life about 2,000 years ago. When well, the story, he's taken up into heaven, and then the Holy Spirit is sent down to the disciples to empower them. Which, by the way, this is Pentecost Sunday, which celebrates and remembers that event of the Holy Spirit being given to the, the disciples. After that happens, though, there is this movement that really takes off, this Jesus movement, and it spreads all over Israel and over the Middle East. And this Jesus movement pops up in all of these different places and looked pretty different depending on where you were at and what group of people it showed up in. Most importantly, however, for the first 300 years or so, this Jesus movement was on the fringes of society both in the Roman society and in the Jewish society. In the Roman society, even, uh, there were points where it was illegal to be a Christian, as in they would occasionally hunt you down and kill you kind of illegal. But then, something changed. In the 300s, in the span of about 70 years, it went from being illegal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire to all of a sudden... The Roman Empire took over Christianity, or a particular version of it, and made it the law of the land. Which means that in the span of just 70 years, which is an incredibly short period of time, it went from being illegal to be a Christian in the Roman Empire to all of a sudden being illegal not to be a Christian in the Roman Empire. That is a huge shift. It is a massive shift and completely changed the course of Christian history. It marks the beginning of something that we call Christendom. It's a time period. Christendom is a time period, a ge geographical region, a way of being, a way of understanding the relationship between the church and the state. Christendom changed a whole lot of things. And quite frankly, not really for the better. At least from a faith or church perspective. In fact, some people have gone so far to say that during this shift in Christianity, or during this shift, something called Christianity became the law of the land and was enforced by the empire. But in the process, the church kind of kicked Jesus out the door. Like I said, this shift changed a lot of things about the character of the church that we could talk about for a very long time. Or maybe I could just talk about for a long time. <clears throat> However, one of the significant things that it changed was to the idea of what it meant to be sent into this world as an agent of God's mission. Before this shift, 
The idea of spreading the good news or telling people about the kingdom of God or, or serving other people or being an agent of God's mission, whatever you want to call that, all of that just happened everywhere there were Christians. Christians were just a part of the world around them, and so there were opportunities to have those conversations, to have those relationships with everybody. They lived in the mission field, so to speak. After the shift, however, well, now everybody in the whole region was assumed to be a Christian. So there weren't people to preach the good news to, which means that all of a sudden, Mission work or evangelism isn't something that happened here anymore. It's something that began to happen over there, somewhere else, not here, and usually with people who were not, quote-unquote, like us. Before this shift, it was just a given that Christians were to share, the, all Christians were to share the gospel and to be missionaries. That's just part of what it meant to be a disciple. But after this shift, you have this situation where you have these specialized missionaries who leave home and go do the work of mission somewhere else, and they do it on behalf of the church. The responsibility of all the other Christians then was then basically just to do what the church told them to do, which, by the way, was also the government, which really just meant being a good citizen and paying your taxes and staying here and doing what you're told. Oh, and by the way, pay for the work of missionaries to go over there and do it for you. Before this shift, the work, of, uh, <clears throat> the work of mission was really about creating disciples. It was about inviting people into a new way of being in the world based on what Jesus said and taught. After this shift, however, well, what Jesus taught, <laughs> funny thing, what Jesus taught is actually kind of threatening to the empire and sort of undermines the foundation of the empire's control. So, so the work of, in the work of mission in Christendom, it's not about doing so much what he said. Don't worry about that. But rather, you need to s say that you agree with a certain set of beliefs about who you think Jesus was. That was really the goal of mission, not actually doing these things. And oh, by the way, we want to know how many people have said that they believe in Jesus so that we can send the numbers back home to the people who sent us to be a missionary. Even more disturbing, however, when you talk about this shift in mission work, um, what mission work often became in Christendom was really not about disciple making, but about cultural destruction, quite frankly. See, if faith and culture, particularly European culture, had merged into the same thing, well, then making people quote unquote Christian really just meant making them act more like white Europeans. Whereas before Christendom, the task was to help people look more like Jesus, which is a very different thing. Quite frankly, looking like Jesus made you look different than society, whereas in Christendom, the goal was to make you look more like the rest of society. Another way to say this is that before this shift, doing the work of mission was something that everybody did. It was something that you did all the time. It was something that we did in our own backyards, and it was about making disciples, people who looked and lived in a particular way, a peculiar way. After the shift, however, mission became a program, a project, something that happened over there, and it was often done by specialists on our behalf. It wasn't something that normal people were really involved in. It was something that supported the empire, not challenged it. In short, mission went from being incarnational to being programmatic and often quite forceful. And yes, on one hand, we can tell this story of Christendom and we can say that those of us in the Brethren tradition and the white, even the wider Anabaptist tradition, we stand in a stream of Christianity that has rejected this whole Christendom project. I mean, a large part of the reason that we exist is because we, act, we were actively rejecting that marriage of the church and the state that Christendom brought and all of the abuses and distortions of the gospel that go with that whole Christendom thinking and mentality and era. But at the same time, we also have to admit 
that there are ways where we have been more shaped by and even used by the force of Christendom than we would like to admit. There are many good things that our mission programs have done over the years that have been very, very Christ-like. But there are also times in our history where the Church of the Brethren and other peace churches have been specifically recruited by governments to do things like destroy native cultures. We were specifically sought out to do that. That said, even those of us who have long rejected the idea of mission work, well, we don't like mission work, but we're going to do service. We're going to serve other people. Even that can wind up, well, being done in such a way that it just maintains our own power and control and keep people and keeps people at arm's length rather than actually investing our lives in the lives of the people that we're helping. As one person once said to me, let's get it straight, Alan. I give to other people. They don't give to me. Got it? It's what I call doing service at people and not with people. And it's still basically a Christendom mentality, which is the idea that we have something that those poor people over there need. And we're going to go take it to them, whether it's food or Jesus or some combination of the two. See, the reason that I bring all of this up is to say that, uh, that when we use words like mission or evangelism or missionary, the, in the vast majority of history, those words have been about saving souls by getting people to say the right words about who they believe Jesus is, and then often forcing them to conform to particular social norms that are more about supporting the empire than they are about following Jesus. But that's not how those words were originally used. For example, the word evangelism or evangelical or evangelize, all of those come from the Greek word eoangelion, which means good news. And in the Gospels, particularly the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells us what the good news is. He announces it at the beginning of his ministry in the Gospel of Matthew. And he says that the good news is, is that the kingdom of God has come near to them. Not that the kingdom of God is somewhere else that you could go someday in the future, but that the kingdom of God has come here to this world, to you. It is now accessible to you when it has been denied before. Mission was not, mission was not then something that we humans did primarily. It wasn't our thing to begin with, but rather mission is what God has been doing throughout history. Mission is the work of God to bring healing and restoration to this world, to the whole world, not just humanity, but plants and animals and even the earth itself. All of creation, including us, is broken in a variety of ways, yes. But it is also still created good and is passionately and relentlessly loved by God and, wants, and God wants it to get better. For us then to join in the mission of God, for us to be actually evangelical or good newsy, to be messengers of the good news, is to be messengers of the good news of the kingdom. To take on that role in our world is to do what Jesus did in the ways that he did it. It's to set our own ego and agenda aside. It's to go out into this world vulnerably, trusting that God will provide through the goodness of those that we meet. It is to empty ourselves and to invest in the lives of those around us. Yes, it is to realize, and I do think we need to own this because it's hard sometimes. It is to realize that each of us do in fact carry a piece of the divine that is a gift that can enrich the life of others. But it is also to realize that every single person that we meet also carries a piece of the divine that will enrich our lives as well. To do this kind of mission is to love daringly, to risk ourselves knowing that some people will return our peace back to us and others will seek to destroy us like wolves. And so, as we continue to speak about mission and evangelism, particularly our work in the city of Wichita, today my prayer is that we might remember that it's this incarnational way of being in the world 
It's that manner in which we are sent into this world. Primarily because that is how Jesus was first sent to us. Amen. Thanks for watching this video from the First Church of the Brethren in Wichita, Kansas. If you'd like to watch another video, click the link on the right. Thanks for liking, commenting, and subscribing on this video. And we'd love to have you join us on Sundays at 9.30 for Sunday School and 10.45 for worship. Everyone is welcome and you're invited.